making. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. So actually love manufacturing. So I'm actually from Cleveland, Ohio. My husband had a small machine shop for several years. So you know who the free labor was, right? It was me on Saturday. So I uh, actually started in training and development back when there were books and videos, VHS. We were doing blueprint reading. Then we got into SPC. Then we started doing ISO when people thought ISO actually stood for something. So that's, I was a wee child though, I must say. But that was years ago. I had five children in between. So someone had to stay home and do the laundry. So Fast forward, they started growing up. I was able to get back into workforce development and worked at our local community college and then ended up at Tooling U SME. So SME is our parent company, Society of Manufacturing Engineers, formerly known as. And the Tooling U part is our learning and development arm. So that's who we are. And I love it. I love working with companies. We work with community colleges. We work with the MEP network. We work with the Workforce Investment Board. So it's a real blessing and it's fun to get out and talk with our partners. And what I'm gonna share today is actually the whole engagement and retention strategies. Key points, so I'm gonna quickly go over. We have a 2018 retention report, leveraging key characteristics of the younger generation and best practices. I talk around the country last week. I was in North Carolina and Massachusetts talking about this. Next week I'm in Georgia. It's everywhere. You're gonna get a great local example, but this really is everywhere. So this whole retention report. So in 2017, they interviewed 234,000 people and asked them why they were leaving. And it came out in 2018. And what they found out, there were specific reasons why they left, but interestingly enough, they also came out with some other great statistics, just talking within this about the cost of turnover. And you all would agree, this is really the elephant in the room, right? This is the big issue. We have all the baby boomers retiring. Boom, we need to talk about this. So your numbers may be similar, but this is what it is. The other thing in the re in uh, retention report, which I do have a copy of it, it's something you'd like electronically, I could send it to you. 40% of all turnover occurs in the first year. So top reasons why they left. I'm gonna give you mixed up here, the four top reasons. What do you think number one is, guys? Reason why people left, 234,000 people left their jobs. Manager behavior. Manager behavior, what else? Anyone else have a different guess? Work-life balance. So, okay guys, I am not creative. It is in the right order. Career development. It's crazy, it used to be manager behavior, it really was, but things have shifted and actually it's a direct correlation to the generations, I believe. So this was the reason. So we know from the 2013 Deloitte study that access to a talented workforce is key. By 2020, they reported this back in 2017. By 2020, which folks, that is in a year, they reported 66% of those who are 39 and under plan to change jobs. That's scary. How much of you, when we started working, I'm an Xer, how many of you started, you know what? I'm gonna give it a while, we'll stay three years, want it to look good on the resume, right? No, that is not how it is anymore. So, but some things never change. Look at some of these old, old, older covers. Nothing has changed. So in today's talent pool, we have five generations in it. You've got everything from your silent generation, maturist, you have your baby boomers, all the way up through Z Gen Z. Gen Z goes to 2011. So anyone born after 2011, so if you have children or grandchildren, those are your Gen Alphas. So they're gonna be helping us solve problems that we don't even know we have yet. So let's talk about it. I'm gonna talk about the Zs and Millennials. Your Zs are about 22 and under, your Millennials are 39 and under. Large population, folks, you wanna know how to fill the skills gap? That's your population. So let's talk about them. Average person owns 7.7 .7 connected devices. Millennials, 12 second attention span, Zs, eight. 15% of 25 to 35, 38 Millennials are living in their parents' home. That is 5% higher than the Xers did at that age, 10% higher than baby boomers. So let's talk about living at home and buying a house. Why did buy baby boomers buy a house? Start a family. Why did Xers buy a house? Investment. Why do millennials buy a house? Well, some say they don't. No, yard for the dog, folks. It is in, there is a Better Homes and Garden study, yard for the dog, and I'm dead serious. It is, it is so true. So let's talk about them. Now I wanna talk some myths and some facts, but let's really talk about why it's important to understand these. So they also value experiences over ownership. Remember this, this is key to them. If you wanna attract them and retain them, you need to remember it's experience. Experiences, experiences, experiences. That's why they love the rock climbing, the tiny homes. They wanna, 
They want to repel and zip line. None of that stuff was around when I was growing up. I, mean, I didn't do any of that. Keep that in mind. So let's talk about some of these myths. Younger generations have no work ethic. Actually, they do. It's more of a dedicated to completing their task well. So it is really self-centered. And why is that? So how many of them, I hear this all the time. You know, this guy he got done, he, it was like 3.15. He goes, he looked and he's like, yeah, I can leave, right? It's all done. You know what? And we're like, yeah, no, you're working until 3.30. So what is it? It's because they actually are gamers. And they do it really well, guys. They look around, figure out where all the lives and the ammo are, and they'll go back a level if they've got to get it for the next one to compete and to win. They do, and it's okay. Use that. Use that on your teams to problem solve, to figure things out. They do it. They even look for the cheats. It's great. It's not a bad thing just because we didn't have it, and we didn't think that way. It's okay. So they don't want to put in the hours to get ahead. You know, I hear this all the time. They, you know, they, they need to pay their dues. I paid my dues. They need to pay theirs. No, come on. We didn't like it either, right? We came in. How many of you had that horrible boss? Oh, my goodness. Maybe some of you still do. I don't know. But no, they're willing to put in the time. However, they're uninterested in FaceTime. So they have given us a new appreciation for time. They're not willing to put in the time. That's not a bad thing. I talked to more extras who are talking about retirement than baby boomers at that age. We value t the time factor, which is very important. No respect for authority. That is so not true. They actually do. Actually, they elevate friends to family status so quickly. And you can leverage this. This is really important. It really is. I always hear, oh, they don't want to grow up. You know what? I told you I had five children. I have four millennials. One's a Z. I hear it all the time. I get the text, Mom, I don't want to adult today. I'm like, sorry, but it's, it's okay. What is it? It's more of a delayed adulthood. You know what they need, guys? They need us to help them. They do. They really do. Think about it. That's what they're needing. The wisdom in the room is what they're needing for that. So let's talk about their key traits, connections and experiences. So important. I hear this all the time. Talk to a CEO in actually back in Ohio, and he was talking to me about this. So I asked him a couple things, and I said, hey, do you got any of them knocking on your door? He's like, oh, my gosh, it drives me crazy. He goes, yeah, they come knocking on the door. I go, do you know why? No, they just shouldn't be knocking on my door. I said, it's because they're a Google generation. These younger generations go to where the answers are found, and if they can't find Steve, who's their supervisor, they're going to come find you because you have the answer. It's not a bad thing. I said, when do you meet them? He goes, oh, I try within the first 30 days. I'm like, no, you got to do it like the first day, the first week. They love those connections and experiences. Workplace value, I love this one. So how many of us, when we started working, if someone had said, you know, you want to feel valued, you'd be like, what? Look in your paycheck on Friday, right? You want to see your value? Look in your paycheck. I always get the extras and baby boomers. Exactly, look in my paycheck. No, these younger generations, they want to feel valued. So it's a little different. It's kind of interesting with that. And you know what? I'm going to tell you right now. If you don't give them the opportunities at your company, they'll just go where they can find those opportunities. Visibility on how their work fits into the big picture. Huge, huge. I know you're going to hear from David and just how he is actually doing some of this. But this is key. They really do. We have an engagement team at our company, and it's kind of crazy. I'm like, what? Engagement team? They're like, oh, yeah, we're going to do something for, like, the food, the, the food shelter and the dog shelter. I'm like, I do that on the weekends, guys. Oh, no, we're going to do it as a company thing. And I'm like... Okay, great, we'll do it. I was part of it and I'm no longer. I'm letting all the millennials run it because they're really passionate about it. I'm like, go for it, it's great. So these are some of their work expectations. I always hear, oh, they don't want to work. Oh, I hear all this negative stuff, so not true. Actually, after I do sessions, I have more millennials come up to me and go, wow, you know, I wish I could get through to my boss. I have new ideas, he won't even talk to me. It's kind of scary. So. Best practices, high performers, future leaders. We need to do this for all the generations so they all feel valued. So number one thing I could tell you, strong onboarding. This is so key. So when we all started, most of us, we started, we said, oh, you know what? First, we'll give it six months, right? This guy's a real jerk. But you know what? I'll stick with it for six months. You know what they do? They give it 60 minutes. How's your onboarding, folks? Hope you're doing some things really different because it's so important. I talk to companies all the time. They're no longer onboarding on Monday. It's Tuesday because Monday they're putting out fires. Not only that, but the first week they do three days, second week four days, 
Third week, five days. They ease them into it. They sometimes help them and remind them alarm clocks sometimes more reliable than your phone. So it's interesting what I'm hearing. So they share the mission and vision actually during the interview because this is important. They want them to be loyal, to definitely elevate friend to family status. It's so important. Give them their gear. Nothing speaks louder than I'm not ready for you if I don't have your hard and soft gear ready for you. Give them company swag. They do want to identify. This is a really good one. Remember, friends to family status. It's so true. Give them the swag. And related to their key traits, which I put back up there for you, this is so important if you can do this with them. So the onboarding. I'm finding companies are texting them the day before. Now, for me, I'm like, really? You got to text me? I, if I'm starting a job, I know I will be there on time. That's OK. So what? It's a little different than we did. What's getting in the way? my pride. I'm finding the HR managers across the country are like, I don't have chance. I don't have room for that. I got to make sure they're going to show up tomorrow. Hey, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. And they're doing it. I'm finding out they're doing it and it's working. It's important. Uh, one of the other things I just uh, was talking to someone in Massachusetts, they actually give their machinists business cards. We're talking about a $9.99 investment folks on someone that gives them their name and their title and the different levels and they love it. These kids loved it, and I was like, hey, who cares? I'm like, if that, if they want, so their friends know, and they're proud of what they do, that's important. So remember what the number one reason was, retention report. Clear training and career pathways. I hope you're communicating this before you hire them, because they want to know that. They want to know how to get from point A to point B. I got four machinist levels. How do I get to each one, or maintenance, or hey, can I move around? They're not interested in the gold watch, folks. So if you can keep them for five years nowadays, that's pretty impressive. They're just not. It's a different atmosphere. It really is. So I hope you're building these. We do this every day with companies. Uh, we work with them and help them take their job roles and actually develop these clear training pathways, whether it's aligned to pay. I Hopefully it is. But it's so important. Important. The other thing with that onboarding and the pathways, I always ask them, are you circling back at the end of the day, at the end of the week, the first month, every three months. You know, how many of us, when we started, we really had performance reviews once a year? Come on, no, we did not. We're happy now, right? We're like, hey, once a year, I wanna sit down with my boss. That's great, they don't. They want it every three months. They need that continual feedback. And clear training pathways show that to them. That's why apprenticeship is picking up, guys. You're gonna see that because it lays it all out. So this is where a strong advocate of a worker qualification model. This is similar like what apprenticeship relies on, where they're getting the knowledge. They have an actual on-the-job trainer that's been certified or at least had some training, just not, hey, Joe, go stick with Steve, you know, make sure he doesn't screw up the machine. So it's important to do that. We do this all the time with companies. And then it's to a standard. They know the expectations, and they're like, oh, that's all I want to know. They want to know the cheat to the game, guys. How do they get it and get it successfully? This is huge. Mentoring and succession planning. Mentoring. How many of you were mentored? Wow. How many successfully? Usually a couple hands definitely go down with that. This is really big. This is huge. Invest in them. Mentoring usually happens at a higher level. This is really good at all levels, actually. They want to navigate life. Some of them don't know how to get the electric in their name. It's the truth of it. Help them, mentor them, find out what their goals are. Friend to family status, you want to have that connection. Give them the experiences, find out. You don't want to find out after they leave that here they just wanted to learn other things. You might have a real closet person there that really could benefit, you could benefit in your organization. You don't know what their resources are. You don't know what, what a diamond you may have. If you have a good mentoring program, you will find that out. And it's a good thing to have. I highly recommend it. Build strong trainers, for sure. I just like the picture, flip classroom. This is really big with the younger generations. They're used to learning with their device. They really are. That's why so many of ours are doing that. That's a, they they want to learn online and then go do hands-on. So important. So these are your best practices to do this. Final tips, don't generalize. Communicate your corporate mission. Show them the future. Provide continual learning opportunities. Go digital. You know, I was laughing, you know, 12 seconds attention span. We're all like, oh, these kids. Okay, guys, come on, let's admit it. It's rolled on to us. I am an Amazon one-click lady, right? We do it. I have the Amazon app. I'm on my phone. App, boom, bought it, done. Love it. How's your online application process? Is it the same way? 
Because I guarantee you the younger generation and your baby boomers are not going to have to appreciate filling out all the boxes and then attaching a resume. Talked to a production manager at a, a shop, and we were talking about apprenticeship, and he was like, you know what, I got all these resumes in. You know, all these kids, oh, they only were there for a couple months. So I was smiling, listening. He goes, yeah, and all this one kid, he sent me this application, and it had all these spelling errors in it. And I'm like, oh, what would you do with it? He goes, oh, I threw it away. I go, really? He goes, yeah, I can't spell. And I'm sitting there, I go, well, that's kind of us. We're the extras. We, we like our spell check. I go, did you ever think that maybe he did it on his phone and it didn't underline the words? And he looked, he's like, oh, I didn't think about that. So go digital, make it easy. Allow them to share their ideas and provide regular and immediate feedback, not just a year later. Do it continually. So I'm going to finish with an interview story. Love this. Perfect. Oh, I got five. Oh, I'm good. So we got five minutes. So love this story. Went to actually a high school. They were doing mock interviews. They always do them about the same time of the year. Went to it, and the guy's telling me, yeah, we did these mock interviews like last week. You would not believe what happened. I go, what happened? He goes, yeah, this kid, I was interviewing him. I asked him a question. And he didn't answer me. So then I asked it a different way. He still didn't answer me. Then I'm like, do you understand the question? And the kid's like, yeah, I do. Well, then tell me. He goes, no, I don't think you'll understand the answer. <laughs> Boom. Slams the book shut. Interview's over. The kid, like, just got hit with a two-by-four. He's like, what, what? And he's like, interview's over. And he tells me this. And I'm like, oh, OK. Ah, that's kind of weird. We never would have done that on an interview. Couldn't have been a month later. Totally different school district. I heard the exact same story. Now I'm irritated. I'm like, what? No way. So I go home. Now at the time, my 17-year-old was, this was last year. She was living at home. She's 18. We did kick her out. Um, she's 17. No, she wanted to move out. 17. She's at home. We're at the dinner table. And we're like, Lizzie, I have a question for you. She's like, what, Mom? She's eating. I'm like, hey, if someone was interviewing you and they asked you a question and you weren't totally sure that they would understand that answer, what would you do? She goes, I don't think I'd answer it, Mom. My husband and I both about came out of our seats. We're like, no, we raised you right. Don't ever do that. Always answer. And if you're not sure, just say so. OK, Mom. She's like, why, why are you asking me this? So now I'm irritated even more. Why is this? Is this th I've just heard now from three different stories. They all did it. Hit me about two and a half weeks later. I'm walking around, picked up my phone. I said, hey, Liz, I got this new app on my phone. Can you help me figure this out? I was like, oh my goodness, we have trained them. And that's so why I always want to end with, guys, you know what? The millennials and the Zs, they're different birds. It's really good. Learn their characteristics, tap into it, and just remember, we raise them. My name is Dave DeSalle. I'm 41 and I live at home. No, I'm just kidding. I don't live at home. I can assure you, I have four children. My wife and I are raising them in our own home. So that's great. Thank you very much for that. So I think, uh, I think some of the stories I'm going to tell today are going to uh, kind of put those things into action. And I want, to tell, I want to start off the talk this morning or this afternoon with telling you a couple of stories. And I want to tell you a little bit about James. James was a lanky and awkward 18-year-old young man when he first visited our shop. Okay? He was a farmer's kid who grew up baling hay, uh, feeding pigs, and shoveling crap. He was picked on during school in search for an outlet to utilize his mechanical curiosity, but couldn't find a manufacturing company that was going to take a chance on him. When he walked through our plant, his eyes lit up. You could see his demeanor shift from a shy, head-down posture to one filled with wonder and curiosity. He found his home. Fast forward five years, James is a top machinist at our company, running anything from a 1968 LeBlanc gap bed lathe to a five-axis machine, state-of-the-art, in the same eight-hour shift. James transitioned from a shy, wide-eyed farmer who was a little bit awkward to a master machinist with no formal education in less than five years because we partnered him with a 40-year veteran and told him to train him. James was and is the beneficiary of our mentoring program inside of P1. John is a 27-year-old machining genius. He's smart, hardworking, loyal as they come. John is technically savvy, knows how to use every conceivable piece of software, and comes from a long line of successful in educated engineering managers at some big companies across diverse industries. However, John likes to build things with his hands. He preferred saw cutters over software and would rather rebuild an engine than design it. John graduated top of his class from the Advanced Manufacturing Program at Hudson Valley Community College, and he built a deep relationship with our shop manager who also adjuncts there. Interestingly, John was nervous to join our company because of the diverse products that we made in a very constrained time frame. But he jumped right in, and we immediately put him to work, working on the most sophisticated machines and on some of the toughest projects in our company for our biggest customers. 
John was given extraordinary permission inside of our company to fail and to learn, and now he is a thriving master machinist with a perfect, listen to me carefully, with a perfect quality record and has grown because of his love for making things embedded with his infectious personality and leadership potential. John is and, will, uh, and was the beneficiary of our apprentice leadership development program inside of P1. One more story. Andrew's a 31-year-old engineer who went to school to become a shop teacher. He lacked communication skills and confidence when he first joined our company in 2012, but he had a unique knack for detail orientation and production planning capabilities. He's almost OCD with his attention to detail, and his growth stalled a bit inside of our company because of lack of communication skills, a lack of confidence, and inability to be customer-centric. However, instead of giving up on Andrew, we reassigned him to a design project that would require him to work directly with the customer and to take a new product concept from the whiteboard to a working machine in less than 12 months. This required iterative design cycles, this required building a supply chain from scratch, generating uh, professional engineering designs in, uh, in stamp drawings. It required building a state-of-the-art automated closure system on a 3,400-pound pressure vessel chamber that was going to be first to market for one of our biggest customers in the U.S. Andrew is the beneficiary and is the beneficiary of our innovation program. He, must have been, he was frustrated throughout the process, but we kept him focused, and we celebrated the small wins with Andrew, taking him from a lacking confidence 31-year-old engineer to a product development specialist who built a product line that's generated millions of dollars in new revenue in our business over the last 12 months. To me, workforce development in a 21st century manufacturing firm has changed, and it'll never be the same again. Finding, developing, and expanding a skilled workforce pl requires playing the long game, being patient, and, and most importantly, discovering talent where the skill doesn't yet exist. It requires recognizing someone's potential and customizing a plan to unlock that talent and to put it to work in a unique and interesting way. We're going to come back to these stories shortly. At our company, P1, we're about 13 years old this year, and I started the company in 2006. And we've grown rapidly. We went from a startup uh, out of a single uh, office in 2006 when I was 28 years old to about an $18 million company in 2016. However, we've gone through a significant transformation over the last 24 months. We lost $10 million in revenue because of our reliance on General Electric. Unless you've been sleeping under a rock, GE's gone through a tough time. But one of the things that's happened in our company, which is quite interesting, is we've invested and poured into these young people with customized programs and developments to develop their unique talents and position them to do things that maybe they didn't know they could do uh, early on in their careers. And we were able not only to replace that $10 million in revenue over 24 months, but we, we onboarded 30 new customers across four new industry segments. We actually replaced it and we're actually growing again pretty significantly. We invested heavily into sales and marketing and launched two new startups over that same period of time. We acquired a large chunk of one of our fastest growing customers in Denver, Colorado. That was something we just closed on last November. In 2019, we're finally growing again and we'll peak over 25 million in organic and acquired revenues with more than 100 employees between Schenectady and Denver, Colorado. This success has everything to do with our team and how we approached our workforce development over the last decade. It's not something that happened overnight. If I tell, when I tell people the story that we lost 10 million revenue over 24 months and we survived to talk about it today and actually starting to grow again, it just blows their mind. And uh, GE, uh, we'll leave a GE where GE is. <laughs> Our workforce has helped us weather the storm and their passion, resilience, and entrepreneur spirit has positioned us to thrive through many challenges. I want to talk a little bit about, we're going to go back to the three stories, but I want to talk a little bit about attracting talent. Because I, I love what Denise talked about in terms of how to approach the younger generations, how to build a workforce. And just to give you a little bit of context, we have over 100 people, and the average age of our employees is 29 years old. If you look at our machinists, we always talk about what our customers said. When you walk through, you're going to think it's a daycare center. Because most of the folks in our shop are between, in the shop, running machines, fabrication, uh, welders, everything else, are between the ages of 18 and 27. We get a little bit higher in the age group when we have engineers and supply chain people, sales and marketing, and some of the other folks that we have working in our business. But how do we attract talent? You know, if you look back over the last 12 years, we've identified, hired, trained, and retained more than 100 machinists, welders, brazers, engineers, supply chain people, quality control leaders, inspectors, assemblers, and salespeople, and we have a 97% voluntary retention rate over that same period of time. 
I have some people that I would wish to God they would leave the company, but they just won't leave. Sometimes I'm like, you really should leave. And they're like, no, I don't want to leave. We faced every major challenge that a manufacturer in the 21st century faces. Right? We have a diminished pool of qualified people. Anyone looking for a certified, qualified machinist is not going to find them in the marketplace. Guess why? They're employed. We are facing uh, higher competitiveness from other industries. Software, com uh, software programming, uh, construction is booming. There's a lot of other alternatives in the industries today that people can work in and make good money. Just before I came up here, I, I rudely took out my phone while Denise was, uh, while she was speaking, because we actually just received an acceptance offer from a 24-year-old who went to school, got a four-year degree in software programming, and decided he wanted to be a machinist. And we hired him. On, we offered him on Friday. He just accepted this afternoon. We're hiring software programmers to run machines, and he's 23 years old. He looked like the, uh, he had these glasses on. He had a perfectly coiffed hair, which I was very jealous of, obviously. And he's just, you know, how are these young people getting so excited about what we're doing inside of our company? And let me tell you. We had to shift in 2010 what our, ability, what our attracting talent strategy was. We went from trying to hire machinists. We stopped looking for them. We said, we don't want to look for machinists and engineers anymore. We want to look for entrepreneurs. We want to look for people who are hungry, who want to grind, who want to solve customer problems, who want to work in a creative and innovative environment. We stopped using language that we're hiring machinists. We said, we're hiring entrepreneurs. If you want to build a business, if you want to be part of something special, come work with us. Come be part of what we're trying to do. We're working with some of the biggest clients on the face of the planet, and we're going to give you opportunity to solve problems and to work with our clients directly. One of the, funnest, the best things I always talk about inside of our company, customers do not call our sales or customer service team. They call our machinists directly. When we onboard a new cu a customer, whether it's GE, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Siemens, Mitsubishi, it doesn't matter who it is, we give them the cell phone number to one of our machinists who make their product. If you want to solve a problem, call the machinist, he'll solve it for you, or she, she'll solve it for you. We shifted our thinking and our approach. No more are we looking for machinists and engineers, we're looking for entrepreneurs. We stopped talking about manufacturing. Why is manufacturing, I love what Fuse Hub's doing and everyone's doing in this room, but manufacturing, when you think about manufacturing, you think about a dying breed. I'm just saying what the world's thinking. I'm a manufacturing guy, my, my family's been manufacturing since 1908, going back to G, tool and die makers, machinists, assemblers, programmers. We are living in an era where manufacturing is associated with dinosaurs. We stopped talking about manufacturing. We started talking about innovation. We started talking about startups. We started talking about the adventure of solving problems, complex problems with a combination of software, mechanical, engineering, machine tools. I got a good friend. He's, he's running one of the fastest growing software companies in the capital region. And he goes, oh, Dave, you know, our guys are real talented. I said, my guys are more talented. He goes, what do you mean? I said, not only can my guys program, but they can put a piece of metal on a machine, touch off on it, put a tool in it, get a first article, hit a tolerance that's thicker than, or less thicker than a, 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 one of your hairs, and they can do it while they're on their phone surfing the internet and buying stuff on Amazon.com. It's that simple. I talk to manufacturing leaders who say, oh, we take the phones away from them. I go, why? That's stupid. Why would you do that? Do you, you want your phone taken away from you? No, you live with it right here. It's like an appendage. I said, our guys are so talented that they can multitask. They can work on a machine. They can surf the internet. Why would you take that away from them and pretend it's 1957? It's not. So we stopped talking about manufacturing. We started talking about innovation. We started talking about innovation. One of the things that we've done over the last couple of years is I started going into the high schools. And I started talking to the young people. And I said, you know, everyone in this room wants to be a Wall Street broker, wants to be a computer programmer, the next Mark Zuckerberg. Everyone wants to make a billion dollars before they're 17 years old. I said, let me tell you something about manufacturing. When you go into a manufacturing or the innovation world of manufacturing, I said, you learn more about business than any other industry in the world. And I'm an MBA graduate, so I understand. I went through my MBA. I learned finance and production planning and all the theoretical stuff you learn in MBA. But I tell them, I said, in the manufacturing business, you learn about inventory. You learn about supply chain. You learn about purchasing, negotiation, sales, customer service, how to build a customer that's probably one of the biggest companies on the face of the planet. You understand how to deal with people on the shop floor, machine tools, CapEx, OpEx. You can't get another job where you're going to learn every element of a business and put your MBA to work more than any other industry than the manufacturing innovation industry. We have so much to offer young people. We just have to position and message it correctly. One of the things that we did, I believe in everything you just said, Denise, you know why? People want to believe in something, they want to be part of something. So we cast a vision. We cast a vision. People say, oh, Dave, you know, you talk about vision and manufacturing. What is that? I said, we're going to revitalize American manufacturing through entrepreneurship. We're going to hire entrepreneurs. We're going to revitalize American manufacturing. They go, but that's impossible. I said, yeah, you're right, it is impossible. 
I said, but if we can contribute 10 jobs to that, we've done our part. Because one of the things that we do in our shop, we put an American flag up. And uh, I could wear those red presidential hats. We, we had the America great again through entrepreneurship before Donald Trump had it. So the, one of the things we do, we put an American flag up. And we, we, when people come in and interview in our business, they said, oh, uh, you believe in American-made goods? I go, of course, we live in America. And you work in America, so we want American-made goods. They said, that really resonates with me. I said, of course it does. It's a vision that's important to you. But we're marrying it with something that's innovative, like entrepreneurship, to say that's what the innovative manufacturing firms of the future are going to be. We cast a vision. We reach deep into the high school and colleges to tell the message that there's an innovative company that wants to put them to work and give them opportunities to create solutions for big customers. We opened up our shop uh, to the community for tours. We wanted to show them the great things that we're making, the things that we're building. We built a vibrant environment to have fun and take, uh, don't take ourselves too seriously. I'm dressed up today. I usually wear t-shirts to work. Some days, if it's nice, I'll wear flip-flops, not on the shop floor. But one of the things that people do when they come in our shop, they said, this is so vibrant. Every machine is running. It's a daycare center. You've got 18 year olds, 25 year olds working along 60 year olds. I've never seen anything like this. We just made an offer to someone yesterday who had six job offers to other manufacturing firms and said he was going to accept one of the jobs, walked through our shop in 10 minutes, and he said, I'm, I'm accepting this job because it's so vibrant. You've got to build an environment that's fun. We got rid of all rules. And you may say, Dave, you're probably losing money. I'm not losing money. We went to a flex work schedule on our shop floor. I said, look, you know what needs to get done. I'm not going to stand over your shoulder and tell you what to do. Get it done. If you get it done because you've got to a dentist appointment or bring your kid to a uh, softball game, whatever you have to do, go do it, but come back and get it done. We started shifting and changing how we approach these things. That's how we attracted talent. That's how we generate a 97% retention rate. How do we develop our workforce? I want to get back to the three stories. One of the terrible things about attracting entrepreneurs is now you actually got to keep them. And when entrepreneur, people who are entrepreneurs want to solve problems constantly. They want to have dy dynamism in their job and work career development and workforce development. So what we started doing, we started customizing our development programs to each individual. We talked about the mentoring innovation and the pre uh, apprentice uh, leadership program. Let me tell you a little bit about that. James, who's a beneficiary of one of our mentoring programs, was paired with a veteran named Freddie. Freddie has spent over 45 years in our industry working in multiple different companies. He's a gray-haired man. I call him my second dad. I always walk up to him, too. It's pretty funny. I walk up, you know, want me to show you what, what you're doing wrong, Freddie? He's like, okay, Dave. You know, I've never even run a machine in my entire life. So we pair, we take James. James is an 18-year-old kid, right? He comes off the street. We put him with Freddie, and we said, Freddie, you're going to work side-by-side side with James. I don't care if it takes a year, three years, five years, or 10 years. I don't care if you're 92 and you've got to train James. You're going to make him better than you are. You're going to pass on every element of knowledge that you have. You're going to take him, cradle him like he's your son, and you're going to teach everything that you've learned over 45 years to this young man. James became a master machinist in less than five years. He was uneducated. He had never even worked on a machine. He had mechanical curiosity. He was entrepreneurial with that regard. We said, work with this man. Put him next to somebody who knows what they're doing. Our mentoring program takes young people with curiosity and work ethic. That's all we look for. Can you get, the job? Can you get to work? You have a car? No, OK, take an Uber. Do you, are you curious? Do you have a work ethic? We're going to put you next to somebody who's going to teach you from the ground up what you can do. Today, James is 23 years old. His favorite thing is gaming. He loves the game. He loves to get out at 3, 30, 4 o'clock and go gaming. That's OK. Go do it. He makes 65 k a year. He's become a mentor to other young people inside of the business. That, to me, is one of the most powerful things we can do, especially if you lack education in machining and other trades. Put him next to somebody who knows. And if that person doesn't want to train him, they don't belong. I don't care how good they are. I know that's hard to say. I run a $25 million company. I, sometimes I had to let people go who were good. But they hold things closer to their chest. We've been in manufacturing a long time. We know those people are out there. They hold things closer to their chest. Job security. I don't want to teach a young person what I know. They don't look like me. They don't talk like me. They use their phone a lot. OK, get over yourself. Teach them. Sean, last year, I taught an entrepreneurship course at my son's high school. I did it Tuesday and Thursday morning. Worst decision of my life, because I travel a lot. And I had to have more or people filling up for me more than I was actually there. There was this young man, Sean, who when he started off the year, he, he wanted to be a computer programmer. By the end of the year, we had him in the shop working. And today, he's in the Hudson Valley Community College program. And he's being mentored by Joel, one of our shop leaders. And Sean is loving life. I ran into his father a couple weeks ago. And he says, you know, Sean is alive for the first time in like five or six years. His, his, he's talking about work. He's talking about the things he's working on. He's so passionate about what he's doing. He's being mentored by the right people. 
If you mentor them with the right people, it's amazing what you can do. Our apprentice leadership program, designed for graduates from local colleges such as HVCC, MVCC, Herkimer College, wherever they come from. We take people, the colleges are doing a great job, by the way. The advanced manufacturing programs, the Hudson Valley and the other schools that are doing these things are amazing. They're giving them the framework, the foundation, the things that they need to come in and talk the language and understand what they do. They're a little bit more elevated than the folks that are coming in off the street. So we don't necessarily put them in a formal mentoring program. What we do with them instead is we give them tough projects to work on and we give them permission to fail. Permission. One of the things that I always say inside of our company, since I started in 2006, we never fire someone for making a mistake. We'll fire them for a bad attitude after making a mistake. But if somebody makes a mistake, there was one time we had a forging. I bought a forging. It was a $35,000 forging. And this young man, Cody, he's 21 years old, running the VTL. He made a miscut on it. We had to scrap it. Oh, Lord. Oh. And I'll never forget. I'm sitting in the meeting. I look at my CFO, and he's fuming. And I'm like, all right, Dave, you believe in your values. Dave, this is what you preach. You, you know, this is the moment of integrity, Dave. And you walk up, put your own around a code, and you said, did you learn what you did wrong, Cody? Dave, I'm so sorry. I'm never going to make that mistake again. Okay, we're going to go back at it, Cody. Get back on that machine. Bought another forging. Put Cody back on that. That's when you're on your knees in the evening and you're on your knees in the morning. Say, please don't let Cody scrap this one. Okay, we're going to double check his program. We're going to mentor him. Cody nailed it. Guess what? That gave him a lot of confidence. It gave him a lot of confidence that he can make mistakes. When you're an apprentice and you're a graduate and you've got a certain level of talent, you've got to put these people on the toughest projects and you've got to be willing to take a little bit of loss in the near term to gain everything you're going to get in the long term. And he's just an amazing human being, John is. Give him tough projects. We give him immediate and constructive feedback. John, you didn't do this very well. What'd you learn from it? Teach the others. One of the things that we do, we have a stand-up meeting once a month, and we say, who made a mistake this month? Come over here, tell them what you did, what mistake you made, how much it cost the company, and tell them what you learned from it. We want to share those things. We don't want other people making those mistakes. That's tough to do. John's encouraged to interact with customers frequently. Again, I told you, we give him the direct phone number. He's enrolled in the New York State Apprenticeship Program. We actually had a payroll service for about six or seven years. I eliminated it because we wanted to institute the apprenticeship program again. In order to do that, you've got to have your own payroll in-house, so we did it. And now we're putting people on the apprenticeship program, which I thought was an archaic program. It's an amazing program. I was speaking because I was naive and I was stupid. The New York State has done an incredible job putting these programs together. It's amazing what people can do. John goes through formal leadership training. We read books. I don't know if you guys do that with your employees. I always force them to read books. At first, I was like, hey, fine, I'll read the book. And I listen to it. And I have my machinists read books. And we have monthly meetings. And we'll go through the books. We read a book about Henry Ford. We talked about his innovation around the assembly line. We read books together. They said, why do you make me read books? I said, because when you read books, it, creates, it generates creativity. And I want you to meet with me to see, you know, let's talk through the book and what you're learning about it. Some of my, my head of sales brings in the, uh, the, the books with all pictures and no words. I'm like, Tony, that's not good for our guys. <laughs> he gives me reports in crayon, too. It's pretty good. So our leadership program, the apprenticeship leadership program, blends on-the-job development through tough projects with high levels of customer interaction and formal training. John's 27, purchased his first home in cash, has a baby, has a one-year-old son. The guy's living the dream. His dad was an engineer, is an engineering manager at a great company. But John wanted to make things with his hands, and we gave him the opportunity to make tough projects. I'm finishing around. Our innovation program, P1's launched an innovative strategy of creating one new product or startup every 12 months. That sounds weird for a manufacturing firm. I brought on a partner a couple years ago. We made a couple of co-investments together. Sold his company, uh, one of the largest independent elevator manufacturing on the planet. And one of the things he told me, he goes, Dave, you have so many capabilities inside of your plant. You have design capabilities, software capabilities, production, prototyping, sales, marketing, customer relationships. He goes, why don't you take all of those capabilities and start launching new products and new startups? I was like, well, Herb, I never thought about that because we're a contract manufacturer. We make what other people design. He goes, I, I know. He goes, but let's, let's start a new program around launching a new product or startup every year. I said, okay. So we leverage our core capabilities to utilize them, design, prototype, and production, and marketing, and so forth, to launch new revenue streams and businesses. I told you about Andrew before. Andrew was given a very difficult customer problem. We literally brought our customer in. They drew up on a whiteboard exactly what they wanted him to design and build and bring it to market, and we let him loose on it. We said we encouraged him to design a new product, put a team together. We gave him the financial resources to work on it. We provided hard deadlines because there was a November trade show, and he was challenged to work with the sales team. Imagine that putting an engineer and a salesperson in the same room. Who's done that before and had really good and interesting interactions? 
Salespeople and engineers don't get along very well. Maybe all you do it differently than I do, but they don't get along very well. So we said to Andrew, a little awkward, maybe not as customer centric as you need to be, you're working with a salesperson for the next 12 months to bring us to market and with a customer. Dave, I, I, I can't do that. Yes, you can, you'll do it, all right? They finished the project about three weeks ago. I could show you pictures, it's an incredible feat what they did, bringing together the largest extraction chamber for a high pressure CO2 platform that's going into the marketplace and it's, gonna, it's a $25 million uh, machine, it's incredible. Andrew delivered an innovative product in 11 months created $7 million in new revenues, and we launched a new business to take this product to the broader market. Here's what I've learned, here's my conclusion. Workforce development is freaking hard. It's freaking hard. Okay, I use another word, but I'm not going to here, I'm on camera. It requires significant patience, and you gotta take the long view. When we tried hiring people prior to 2010, we, we discovered that every person who's super talented is hired. We had to cultivate where we were. We had to bring in the entrepreneurs and cultivate them and come up with unique and customized ways to develop them. And some people might say, oh, Dave, it's easy to say. No, we've done it. We built a 100-person team. We were a startup 12 years ago. We didn't exist. We had to do this the hard way. We had to cultivate people from the ground up and take chances on truck drivers, cement truck drivers, farmers, people who had never touched a machine tool before. We had to take the long game. Stop looking for positions and start looking for people. Because workforce development is no longer about recruitment, it's about relationship. Because if you build a relationship with your people, you'll discover the unique talents that they have, and then you can customize how you develop them and unlock that talent. Stop looking for positions, start looking for people. Create an environment where people actually want to work. That's not so hard to do. It doesn't mean you have a keg on tap. If we have kegs on tap, we're, we're destroying machines. But we can do other things. My, my, I joke about that because my friend runs a software company. They have kegs on tap. He goes, Dave, why don't you just do kegs? I'm like, that's great. We want a $700,000 piece of equipment. We're going to make parts uh, with a keg uh, on tap. It's great. I said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to have coffee. We're going to put coffee on tap. It's not about recruiting. It's about relationship. Customize your development to the individual, mentoring, leadership, and innovation. And be creative and challenge your people to cast a wildly exciting vision. Challenge your people. It'd be amazing the creative ideas and things that people want to do. I helped uh, several machinists start companies in their own backyard. I become their first customer. They're like, really, you're gonna let me buy a machine and, and work at night on my own stuff? I go, of course, you're an entrepreneur. I don't want to make you not be able to do that. We'll give you an order. Go home, uh, great, you work for me all day and then I can give you work at night, it's perfect. <laughs> and you can put your wife to work or your husband to work or whoever stays at home, it's perfect, I love it. Matter of fact, we'll give you the programs too. And last but not least, this is really important, and you may think this is weird. This is, you know, I, I, my, my, my folks always tell me there's no room for love or, or care in manufacturing. I disagree with that. Least but not, last but not least, if you care for your people, they will commit to your cause. If you care for your people, they will commit to your cause. I have a gentleman, uh, Jerry Miller. His wife got in a horrible car accident about six months ago. You know, Jerry came to me and says, oh, Dave, you know, I, do, I, I might have to go on FMLA. I might have to do a few other things. I said, stop it right now. I said, you take care of your wife. I said, we're going to pay you. You do what you got to do. You go bring her to her doctor's appointments. He said, you don't need to worry about pay. You don't need to worry about making your mortgage payment. You go do what you got to do. You've been here for six or seven years. I got your back. I got your back because I know you got mine. If you care, they'll commit to your cause. If you care, you'll commit to your cause. And by the way, these are just some of the things I've learned and some of the things that we've applied in our own company. Did we get it all right? Of course not. You know, it's easy to speak up here in front of everyone and say, yeah, we did everything perfect. That's not true. I've made a lot of stupid mistakes. We've made a lot of stupid mistakes. I think at the end of the day, we've got a lot more right than we got wrong. And I think some of the data supports that. So that's my story. Thank you.